Just a few years ago, one researcher gained huge publicity and influence for calculating that the Earth could fit another 1.2 trillion trees, and this would have a major difference on climate change with all of the carbon that would be absorbed. Planting a trillion trees became a rallying cry taken up in many different places, from the United Nations to corporations to the most influential YouTubers. Yes, I am aware not all the things on that list are the same, but anyway. Now it's being suggested that, well, maybe that was, you know, a mistake, and really the self-same researcher would really like people to stop planting so many trees. What's going on? And what are the lessons that we could learn from it? Since learning from our mistakes would be a good thing to do, presumably. Well, let's have a look. Here is ecologist Thomas Crowver. Plus some trees. In 2019, he produced a study for the journal Science that took off and became something of a sensation. I mean, at least to the degree that papers for scientific journals ever do. The study tried to identify the potential extra space for tree planting across the world. So here's one map from the study showing where trees could be planted once you remove existing tree cover and urban spaces and agricultural areas from the target. It came up with the answer that you could plant over a trillion new trees in the 0.9 billion hectares that was available to do it. And there was particularly space to do this in Russia, in the United States, in Canada, Australia, Brazil and China. Which is obviously really good news because Vladimir Putin loves trees. Reportedly. Unlike most scientific papers, it wasn't hedged and nuanced with a string of qualifications, ifs and buts. It was a pretty simple, relatively dramatic equation. If you planted a trillion trees, it would equate to around 25 years worth of carbon emissions. At the time, Crowver told one of the many journalists writing it up, the nice thing about this solution is it's really low tech. It doesn't need a politician to make a decision and it doesn't need a scientist to come up with some new invention. All it needs is all of us getting involved. Simple solutions pushed to scale without pesky politicians getting in the way. Definitely no chance of unintended consequences then. Or as H.L. Mencken once said, a quote misattributed to numerous other people, by the way, there is always a well-known solution to every human problem, neat, plausible and wrong. But plausible it certainly was, and before long you had a bunch of people jumping onto it with enthusiasm. A number of corporations, for instance, Royal Dutch Shell announced plans to invest $300 million dollars over three years in reforestation projects. Mark Benioff, the founder of Salesforce, he launched the OneT.org platform, which is still going today, and his company pledged to support and mobilise the conservation and restoration of 100 million trees over the next decade. Various governments jumped onto programmes for tree planting. Indeed, then President Trump, in his State of the Union address in 2020, announced that the United States would be joining the One Trillion Trees Initiative. The biggest YouTuber on the planet, Mr. Beast, launched Team Trees, where he, and supported by a number of other major YouTubers, raised money to plant 20 million of them, a campaign that attracted support from Elon Musk, amongst others. This article about the campaign quotes Crowver's research as an important validation. It quoted Crowver as saying that trees are, quote, our most powerful weapon in the fight against climate change. So why had this one paper been so influential? Well, it's simple. No, I mean, that's the reason. It's simple. Crowver reflected on what he felt was a key learning 
but relatively simple studies clearly communicated, in other words, without all those tedious ifs and buts that, for instance, keeps this channel from megastardom, that the simple things can excite the media and the public better. And he agreed that that might not be fair. And he said this, there's loads of genius scientists, way smarter than me, who are not willing to communicate their science so it doesn't get the attention it deserves. And with influence came success. Crowther received an invitation to apply for funding from DOB Ecology, a Dutch foundation, and it wanted a very ambitious proposal to fund, it told him. Like, for example, creating a team of programmers, remote sensing experts, modelers and communication specialists to carry out 13 global scale studies. In October 2017, he was awarded a $2.7 million grant with a promise of a lot more if he met certain targets. This was suddenly an embarrassment of riches, and not everyone in the rather hand-to-mouth ecology community was that impressed. But, you know, professional jealousy can do that, so maybe they should just learn the lesson that he's taught them. By the time we got to COP28 conference in 2023, that had all somewhat changed. Thomas Crowther gave a presentation at that conference pleading with world leaders to um, stop planting so many trees. And he said this, if no one had ever said, plant a trillion trees, I think we'd have been in a lot better space. By no one, he presumably means no one named Thomas Crowther, but whatever. So why the change of heart? Well, to be fair, the pushback started quite some time ago. A number of scientists objected to the original paper. Simon Lewis, a forest ecologist at the University of Leeds, went so far as to say, Science magazine have lost their critical faculties. And he tweeted, calling the paper shockingly bad. He said the carbon removal calculation was plain wrong, overstated by a factor of two. That's not how the global carbon cycle works, he said. Other critical comments were published in Science. For example, one slamming the work for favouring converting ecologically valuable grasslands and wetlands to forests and ignoring how all those new trees might affect water supplies and temperatures. One of the commentaries by Friedlingstein et al. said this, The claim that global tree restoration is our most effective climate change solution is simply incorrect scientifically and dangerously misleading. In the face of this barrage, Crowther and his team started to retrofit some of that nuance, the absence of which had made them into such megastars. So they revised the paper to reframe tree planting as, quote, just one of the most effective carbon drawdown solutions. They did reject some of the other objections, though. So, for instance, they denied promoting the conversion of grasslands and wetlands. But then, at the COP28 conference, the retreat seems to have gone further. Crowther now complains that his message was misinterpreted. He published a more nuanced paper this year with 200 scientist co-authors arguing that preserving existing forests is a higher priority. Restoring destroyed or fragmented forests by planting trees would absorb a potential 87 gigatons of carbon, it said, but allowing existing forests to grow to maturity would absorb an additional 139 gigatons. And he was keen to take those results to COP28, he said, to try to kill a tide of greenwashing that the previous study had seemed to encourage, planting trees as a cover for otherwise carrying on business as usual rather makes you think that there's an important lesson here that is going unlearned. Namely that scientific research is at its best when it's seeking understanding 
at its core without being immediately focused on solving a policy problem, particularly a single variable one. The problem with Crowther's initial work wasn't that it was simple. It was that it was designed to provide an answer to a question. How does the world reduce CO2? Which is fine, it's a good question, it's something we have to do. But the potential for unintended consequences multiplies when you take that single variable question and think that is the bigger exam question. You might easily ask, how do you maximise the health and resilience of existing natural systems and human societies while reducing human impact on the climate? That is much more likely to be the real exam question. And it just happens to be a harder and more complex question than headline writers and political activists would like. Because yes, ecology is complex. I did an interview a couple of years ago with Becky Spate, who was then the chief executive of the Woodland Trust. She's now chief executive of RSPB. She talked at length about how much richer in species diversity is ancient forest versus newly planted woodlands. Not plantation forest, just any relatively new woodland. The full mix of interdependent species takes a lot of time to really transform the space into a complex, thriving and healthy ecosystem. So it's not a huge surprise that just plonking a trillion trees into every bit of open land that could cope with them wasn't going to prove to be the get-out-of-jail-free card that it promised to be. But you might actually end up destroying a bunch of stuff that already works in different ways in order to install something that works less well. And also, even if a study produced a map that removed farmland from the equation, it's not necessarily how it gets translated into action in the real world. So Wales, for instance, companies have been buying up farms to plant trees to offset their CO2 emissions. The Welsh government is also incentivising farmers to plant trees on agricultural land, not least because it needs to replace hundreds of hectares of woodland to replace the woods that it cut down itself to site wind farms there, to remedy the unintended consequences of a different policy, in other words. Meanwhile, half of Wales's supposedly protected sites for existing rich biodiversity, they are not being monitored or policed in any way. Do we think the people responsible there are fully in charge of their brief? I mean, I guess they might well be good people trying their best. I mean, they might be. But the evidence from the outcomes isn't encouraging. Changing the world for the better is hard, particularly if you don't take the time to understand what you're changing and why and what the full consequences are likely to be. A lesson that you should take time to learn for 2024, whether you're politically on the left or on the right, whether you're a corporation, whether you're an NGO or a campaign, or even just a good-hearted citizen trying to do their best. And every time a new paper or policy goes viral because it's so much simpler and more compelling than all that boring stuff with all the ifs and the buts and the maybes, just bear that in mind. If it seems too good to be true, yeah, it usually is.